Well, good morning, Cornerstone, and welcome to Sunday, the 21st of March. Uh, wherever you're meeting, I trust that uh, that everything is well with you and that your meeting is going ahead well. Um, open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2 this morning, and we're going to have a look there. So I'm sort of struggling between Colossians and Philippians this morning as to um, what to minister on, but I think I'm going to stick with Colossians um, and talk about the preeminence of Christ. And uh, so let's have a look in Colossians chapter 2 this morning. So Colossians emphasizes... Um, Christ is the, uh, the head of the body, um, you know, the church, the body of Christ. Um, while Ephesians really talks a lot about Christ as, uh, or the church rather, as the body of Christ itself. So when we look at these two together, we can see a lot of parallels between them in emphasizing the headship of Christ over the church. And this is an important thing because uh, headship doctrines form the foundation of a lot of error within Christianity today because there's an over because of an overemphasis of um, the top-down authority within churches. So let's have a look at uh, Christ's preeminence, and um, we'll have a look at how Paul defends that. So if you you know if you take your time to read through the book of Colossians, uh, you'll see that Paul is talking about Christ's preeminence all the way through the book. And he talks about that in the gospel message in chapter one, uh, that the preeminence of Christ is a, a theme of the gospel and it's all throughout the record of scripture in uh, the cross and the creation um, and that his preeminence is supposed to therefore be demonstrated in the church um, and Paul makes the point of saying that it was in his own ministry uh, in Colossians 1 verse 24. He says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is in Christ in you. Uh, sorry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'll oh, imagine messing, messing that up. I'm going to read verse 27 again. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So Paul's whole ministry was, was devoted to um, uh, glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And his ministry was about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and then teaching those who were converted so that he can present them mature to Jesus. And that was what he was striving for. So... Let's um, go on into chapter 2 then of Colossians. And I don't say let's go on because we've been looking at chapter 2, but, but because of that introduction uh, to chapter 1 uh, there or from chapter 1. So it turns out that um, there was some um, uh, crisis taking place. Um, among the, or in the church, um, and it had been reported to him that the church was in trouble. And um, 
you know, that there was a, a new teaching invading the church. And this, this heresy today we generally call Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is this, essentially means knowledge. And so it's the idea of having special knowledge. Uh, that's what the Gnostics claim, that God has revealed this to me. And so when you ask for a, um, a scripture on that, they don't really know a scripture uh, on that, or they, they would say this has been revealed to me from heaven. This is a superior knowledge or, or a spiritual understanding that I have that not many people have. And um, so, you know, the doctrine then um, uh, is very mystical in its approach. So um, these Gnostics and heretics that were invading the early church, they taught that um, uh, matter was evil, including the body itself. And that therefore, uh, you know, God couldn't come in contact with matter. They had this mystical view. Um, how then, you know, the, if the if the body is evil, then how could God take on a human form and come to the earth? Um, these kinds of things. So the the Gnostics had this um, strange uh, teachings that that. Um, because Christ had a human body, he was only an emanation and not truly the Son of God. He was just a, a, an appearance of deity, but not actually deity. And there was a, you know, there was a, obviously a complex uh, theological argument about this. So this was supposed to give these teachers um, some special knowledge that others don't have and that is only found through their teaching. Um, and so therefore they, they would call for allegiance to them um, because you're not going to find this anywhere else. So with that in mind, um, let's go to chapter 2 and um, let's think about the... Uh, you know, what Paul is teaching there um, in chapter 2. So uh, verses 1 through 10. And before we do that, why don't we just pray and, um, and commit the morning into the Lord's hands. Our Father, we thank you for this morning and we just thank you that wherever we are, Lord, we can... Uh, gather and we can look into your word and we can seek you for your uh, purpose and for your instruction this morning. We praise you and we thank you. We ask you, Lord, just to bless the home gatherings. Uh, Lord, be among the people who gather in the homes and let there be a rich sense of fellowship and joy this morning as believers gather and share one with another in a desire to worship you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Colossians chapter 2. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not, um, as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in love, are rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So you can see immediately that Paul is confronting this attack in the church and he gets to the heart of the problem here. He denounces the false teachers. 
um, and he asserts very clearly the sufficiency of Christ uh, for every need, but also the deity of Christ. And he sounds these warnings um, and they, they need to be heard as well today because there are plenty of empty uh, philosophies invading the church uh, in this day and age. And so burdened was Paul. Um, he was in this spiritual conflict for the people, wrestling in prayer um, against Satan, who was seeking to lead the believers astray. So Paul knew, he knew how to battle. Um, he knew what spiritual battle was all about. And he knew, you know, he knew how to pray and overcome the enemy's attacks against the church and the enemy's attacks against the word of God. Um, and, in a, you know, Paul would write to the Ephesian church and he would talk about putting on the whole armor of God. He longed to see the saints united in Christ and enjoying the riches of of blessings in him and enjoying a rich fellowship with Christ, um, you know, and, and, and serving and worshipping him as the head over the church, serving and worshipping Christ as the head over the church. So false teachers, you know, when they, when they attack uh, the doctrinal basis or when, when, they, attack, when they attack doctrines, uh, sound doctrines, they do so to enrich themselves and not just materially, but with a following um, or with a sense of uh, entitlement and with a sense of um, prestige. So, you know, man-made philosophy has no place in the church. So you can see in verse 3 that Paul says to the church, um, when he speaks of Christ, he says, in him or in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the Gnostics will and, and false teachers will approach the church and they will say, well, this is revelation that God has given me. And, um, you know, you can see this in many of the 20, 20th and 21st century cults that the leaders, um, you know, the founders of these churches, the founder of um, Mormonism, for example, they they claim special revelation that God gave them, um, and so Paul says to them, "Listen, the the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ Jesus, and so if you want to know what those treasures are, those whatever what those wisdoms are, if you want to know that knowledge, then look into the Word of God and study." about the Lord Jesus Christ, because man's philosophies can be very attractive. If a, if a person comes to the Christian church and has some disguised doctrines and starts teaching people, well, there is a, um, uh, an elevation that you can achieve and you can come to a place of godhood uh, and you can achieve that kind of status um, this might be appealing to people who are not sound in the faith, who aren't solid in the faith. And so they can be led astray into um, some false belief. And so, you know, these false doctrines and false teachings are themselves appealing. Um, and also the false teachers themselves are very charismatic usually. And so they, they appeal to people. Notice what Paul says in verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. You know, they're, they're not um, deceiving people with a, uh, with an appealing, uh, without an appealing appearance. They're not deceiving people without a, um, uh, an appealing set of words. These are persuasive people, persuasive uh, words that they have. And so... You know, they're being, as the King James would say, uh, beguiled with enticing words. Um, and it's, it's tragic when you see young people go off to um, secular schools and uh, they're persuaded against Christ through man-made philosophies that are in the world. You know, the evolutionary theories and and very various different things. And so Paul says, 
in verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. This is why it's really important to build that foundation into your children so that there would be uh, that strength of understanding of exactly who the Lord Jesus Christ is so that they can't be taken captive with these um, vain uh, words and vain philosophies according to the tradition of men. Um, and now let's ask the question then, how are believers to, uh, you know, how are, how are we as believers um, to overcome these philosophies? Well, Paul approaches that by saying in verse 6, as therefore you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. So the manner in which you became a believer, continue walking in that way. So there's a simplicity to this. You were saved through the hearing of the gospel. The gospel, Paul says, is the power of God unto salvation. And I don't think it's, well, in fact, I think it is important not to allow mystical understandings of how salvation works to invade your thinking. You were saved, this is a work of the Spirit, through the gospel message. Keep to the simplicity of that. And you know, that, that in itself, by responding to the gospel message, is a learning to walk in the Spirit of God. Christian living began that way and should continue that way. Continue in the Word of God and walk that simply. So that is going to lead, as you do that, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him, in verse 7, how do we walk in him in that way? Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So you and I were saved by faith through the word of God. So we're to continue in that and we're to put our roots down, dig them down deep into the richness of the word of God, rooted and built up in him. You know, the, the richness of the Word of God, that's where foundations are formed strong, is down into the Word of God. Um, that's what we're to do. We're to, we're to lay hold of Jesus Christ in that way. It's so important for us to be, to be digging into the Word of God and establishing our faith in the Word of God. Because oftentimes, believers fall prey to religious philosophies when they have not rooted themselves in the Word of God. And so they become grounded in, in um, you know, our, our defense against those kinds of um, uh, pulls into false philosophies and into false doctrines. Our defense against that is being rooted and grounded in the Word of God, built up in biblical truth. Now, the, the next... Um, uh, defense against these philosophies is to make Christ himself the test of that philosophy. Beware lest anyone, verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So, you know, these, these high sounding spiritual philosophies that enter the church or enter Christianity, do they have Christ in his rightful place of preeminence? Because almost every uh, almost every religious philosophy speaks of Christ. Um, but it doesn't necessarily give Christ the preeminence. So when you think about the, 
new age movement that many Christians have been conned into, you know, that through um, mystical teachings, that many of those new age movements talk about Christ. Uh, they talk about the Christ. They talk about um, you being Christ. Uh, you are a Christ, all this kind of thing. Um, but they don't give Christ his preeminence. They don't talk about worshipping the one and only true and living Lord Jesus Christ. So only true biblical Christianity gives Christ the preeminence and the lordship over the church. Um, and that's because in verses 9 and 10, it, it places Christ Jesus into that position of lordship. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So this was a really important issue that Paul had to deal with in the church. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Notice that Paul has not said that you have become a little Christ, a little God, uh, a, a human uh, deity. Paul says here that Christ is the fullness of the Godhead. All of God was crammed into him bodily. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There is no substitute for Jesus. Um, and in Jesus, you and I have all that we need. So when we get caught up in the world's philosophies and into false doctrines and uh, various different mystical teachings, one of the reasons why people get caught up in that is because they, um, they drift into a, a place in which they feel like they're lacking things and that they just want more. And they want more in a dissatisfied sense that somehow Christianity can't provide all that they're after. But Paul says, you are made complete in Christ Jesus. And this is an awesome position for us to be in this morning is to be found in Christ Jesus. Now, he then goes on to, uh, to talk to them about religious legalism. Now, I've preached a lot about this over the years, um, so I just want to touch on this gen just generally. Verse 11, let's read through to verse 17 uh, there, verse 11 to verse 17. Um, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and this uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So, you know, these false teachers had mixed a, a um, early oriental mysticism um, and a philosophical, uh, a Greek philosophical approach and Jewish legalism, and they'd, they'd mash them together. But the flesh, you know, the flesh loves this because what happens out of that is that people get a, a religious um, sense of um, elevation and 
uh, a religious sense of pride in what they're doing, that somehow what they're doing is a um, is achieving a a greater ascendancy in their in their worship and their devotion to the Lord that is above other believers. Um, and so you know that the flesh loves that. The flesh loves uh, to be religious, so long as the um, uh, the the flesh is elevated in that uh, in that religious service, and that can have, that can appear like uh, forms of legalism, uh, where the the individual does certain things that appear from the outside to be so uh, pietistic. But when you actually scratch beneath the surface, you realize that it's just their own flesh being satisfied through this work-based system that they have. And the Colossian believers were involved in Jewish legalism. They were following rituals and following diets and and, and the holidays, the festivals, and so on. Um, uh, and so, you know, in, in verse 17, Paul says that these things are just a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Um, so they're just a shadow of things to come. Imagine looking at someone's shadow and saying, Oh, look at the beauty of this individual when the individual is standing right there and, and our gaze is on the shadow. And, and Paul is saying, you know what, following these festivals and, and these uh, dietary requirements and legalistic requirements, they're just a shadow. That's not the, you're not worshipping Jesus actually. You're getting satisfaction out of these forms that are only a shadow of Christ. Look to him and worship him. And this is really um, an important thing because Paul is saying, you know, you're going out of the sunlight. You're, you're in the shadows there. Um, you're forsaking Christ's, the real worship of Christ uh, for a, a carbon copy, so to speak. Um, you know, so imagine admiring someone's photo when you're sitting right next to them. Um, when you can be in their presence. So all that we need has been accomplished by Christ on the cross. And the circumcision that he speaks of here um, in verse 11, he specifically says this was not made by hands. Paul says, in him you also were circumcised, circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. And it has to be noted there that he's not talking about a physical circumcision. Um, and, you know, therefore we could also say that the baptism he speaks of there is not necessarily a water baptism, but a spiritual baptism. We're buried with him by immersion. Um by being immersed into Christ. Uh, so we are buried with him through faith. You know, this immersion uh, that when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we were buried with him in the same way in which he died, you, by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, have been buried with him so that as he resurrected, you've been raised to a new life. Uh, Romans 6 would explain that a bit more clearly for us. So, um, you know, Christ's death and burial were an accomplishment that he was able to achieve so that by faith in him, you also were circumcised spiritually um, and you also were buried with him spiritually and raised spiritually to a new life as well. He took, he took our sins with him to death. We weren't able to do it. And so our spiritual circumcision in Christ is far more wonderful than, um, than the physical deed could ever be because in Christ Jesus, he's accomplished the, the cutting off of the sins of the flesh 
in our lives. He's, he's been able to sever them so that a true um, sanctification has taken place. The sins of, of your flesh were cut off by Jesus Christ in his death. So if that is not able to be accomplished through legalism, then why, and it never was able to be, but why would we replace the service and the worship of Jesus Christ with some form of mosaic legalism? Why put on Moses, uh, you know, instead of the, the true circumcision, which is, you know, that, that physical circumcision in legalism, uh, the legalistic practice in the Mosaic law of circumcision, is only a fragment of what is accomplished in Christ Jesus. So our identification with Christ puts off the whole of the fleshly nature and it's made possible through union with Jesus Christ by faith in him. And that's when Jesus uh, then he baptizes us into his body. He immerses us into his body. All of this that Paul is speaking of in Colossians is a spiritual accomplishment that Christ Jesus um, achieves through faith in him. And I'm aware, just being aware there of the time that I've taken already this morning. So, um, uh, the you know, the old covenant laws are set aside and we need to be careful because they're not redundant, um, but they're not, we can't achieve anything by adherence to them. We died with Jesus by faith in him. We've been resurrected with Jesus by his work in us. Um, so, you know, this is a complete defeat of the enemy. Let's not go back to, uh, to allowing the enemy to have control over our lives. So Paul says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, uh, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. So, you know, it, it's texts like this that have just made me um, uh, weary of, of that's weary, not weary, weary as in tired of debating with legalists because it is so obvious in what Paul is saying that there is a liberty to be found in Jesus Christ. So let's not go back uh, under the, those legalistic practices. Now, the facts are that the flesh loves legalism. Let's just quickly read from 18 to the end. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, that which is pride. False humility. It's it's um, uh, you know a, some kind of declaration of of humility, and yet um, it is vanity. Taking delight in false humility and worship of angels intruding into those things which has not, uh, which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, <coughs> do you subject yourselves to regulations? Excuse me. So I'll just read that again. If you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, 
but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Now, it seems like Paul here kind of says contradictory things, but he is not at all. And Paul is talking about the power here of these, these um, ascetic approaches, these approaches that were part of this mishmash of false, false doctrine that had come into this church uh, or, or was attempting to come into the church. Um, you see, special religious observances make people feel spiritual. And Paul says in verse 18, don't let anyone cheat you of your reward, reward taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels intruding into those things which they have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. You see, the, um, there is an effect that this, these practices have, these ascetic practices combined with this Gnostic legalism, um, because they're a counterfeit of true spirituality. Um, and it, it, it beguiles people because it gives them such a feeling of elevated worship, um, you know, because there is nothing wrong with a sense of discipline in our approach to the worship and service of God. But when it's done in the flesh, when it's done for vain glory, when it's done for a sense of, uh, of, of elevation of self, it becomes sinful. So, uh, you know, believers should not abuse their liberty that they have in Christ Jesus. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, Will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? In other words, if you've got a liberty, the weak person might get involved in, in idolatry. And so we don't want to be a stumbling block, um, you know, but at the same time, we don't want to... Um, uh, believe that giving up certain habits or pleasures makes a person's a person spiritual. Our relationship to Christ is a living union. Um, he is the head, and we are members of the body. And a body functions; the human body functions through nourishment, not legalism. And um, you know, we that's that's how it is. You know, we 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 nourish the body. Uh, and Paul says to them in verse 19, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows to the increase uh, with the increase that is from God. So in other words, there is a spiritual nourishment that comes from the Lord and the whole body is knit together and the whole body is nourished by him in the same way that we don't necessarily understand how the body um, uh, nourishes is nourished by the consumption of food, the human body. In the same way, uh, without that consumption of food, the, the human body is not going to be nourished. And so without the, the um, correct understanding of uh, the effect of these legalistic and Gnostic practices, we won't understand that it's Christ who nourishes the body by faith in him. So you know we need to be we need to be aware of that it's not our uh it's not this false humility that that is rooted in these practices that nourishes we're not nourishing ourselves with these ascetic practices and with the these legalistic practices so you know our relationship with Christ is a living union and he is the one who nourishes us as the body of Christ and I, I think it's interesting that in verse 20, Paul says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you sub subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which are perishing, 
uh, with the using according to the commandments of the doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and the neglect of the body, the physical body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. This is the, the thing with the Gnostics and the ascetics, that they will place a, an, a, an elevation of human wisdom to be gained through the um, uh, what's the word the neglect of the human body the f the physical body that somehow by a denial of the the flesh through natural means i.e. eating and and uh, you know the the eating of food and and drinking of uh, liquids to nourish the body that by denying that comes a spiritual elevation. Um, and this is this was part of the the imposed piety of and you know the the superior spirituality of these ascetics. Um, you know, but it's useless. These kinds of things are useless as far as the worship of God is concerned. Um, and so this is one of the main themes of Colossians. All believers needs are met in Jesus Christ. Let that sink in for a moment because a man-made system does not meet your need. Legalistic practices do not meet your need. Gnostic teachings do not meet your needs. Worldly philosophies do not meet your needs. These things will all lead to a shallow spirituality. They are the shadow when we're to be looking to the real form. You know, man-made disciplines, they're attractive because when we can impose a rigid self-discipline, and I'm not against, there is a value to discipline, but discipline itself is not spiritual. It doesn't lead to spirituality. Um, you know, the flesh the flesh is, is a tricky beast because we can, we can derive pride from self-discipline. So we have to be careful with that. Paul said to the Galatians, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect? by the flesh. You, you began by faith. So are you now being made perfect through legalistic fleshly practices? So, you know, we have to be careful of this. There's, there's going to be constantly be a pull for us to demonstrate our piety through legalistic fleshly practices. So our union with Christ is a living union that is kept alive through faith in him. And it can't be controlled by uh, or can't be enhanced by legalistic practices, um, but only by the principles that God has put into the body of Christ. So, um, you know, we need to remember that, that only the life of Christ can enhance your spiritual life. And so when you placed faith in Jesus, his life came into you. His life came into you, the Spirit of God within you. So now let's allow the Spirit of God to work within us. So, And that is done by reading the Word and meditating upon the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Um, I'm going to close that off here. Um, but let's let's be wary of the power and the the um, the workings of these vain philosophies and these legalistic and gnostic practices uh, because there's something we're going to have to fight with always um, and they even in conservative realms there are um, uh, gnostic teachings that that are not scriptural and they are rooted, they, they're deeply entwined into 
traditional into many traditional teachings within the body of Christ. Genuine believers who believe um, uh, Gnostic teachings. And we might talk about that more in the future. God bless you this morning. Enjoy the rest of your uh, time together with one another.